Thanks for joining us today for our webinar. We're excited to have you with us. My name is Amy Klaus, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Early Childhood Assessment Tools here at Brooks Publishing. Today's webinar is on using the ASQ3 and ASQSE2 together. This is the third webinar of Spring Series, and we're excited to have um, several of our author ASQ development team members with us. The earlier recordings from the series are posted on the ASQ website if you're interested in viewing them. So our speakers today are Jane Squires, Jantina Clifford, and Suzanne Yockelson. So we're happy to have them. Before I introduce them, though, I want to go over some quick uh, housekeeping tasks. You'll be muted for the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box, and we'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A. For best audio and screen quality, you may want to exit any unneeded programs. And if you're listening through your computer speakers and you're having um, any issues with the sound, you can also choose to dial in through your telephone. Sometimes that connection works better for people. Also, we're recording the webinar, and you'll receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. You'll also receive a link to the webinar slides in your follow-up email. And feel free to share information about the webinar or the recording um, with your colleagues. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, Dr. Jane Squires has served as Principal Investigator on Research Studies at the University of Oregon on Developmental Screening Systems, Personnel Training, and Social-Emotional Development of At-Risk Infants and Toddlers. She is a professor in special education, focusing on early intervention and early childhood special education. She directs the Early Intervention Program and is Director of the University of Oregon Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Dr. Jantina Clifford is a faculty member at the University of Oregon Early Intervention Program, where she teaches graduate courses in early intervention and early childhood special education. In addition to teaching, Dr. Clifford provides training internationally on the ASQ3, ASQSC, and SEAM. Her professional interests include personnel preparation and the development and evaluation of early childhood assessment measures. Prior to the pursuit of her doctoral degree, Dr. Clifford served as an early childhood educator for eight years. And Dr. Suzanne Yockelson is an assistant professor at Brandman University in California. She earned her doctorate from the University of Oregon in 1999 and remained on faculty in the College of Education until her move to California in 2007. Immediately following her move, Dr. Yockelson was the EPIC coordinator at Help Me Grow in Orange County, California, where she worked with the county's system of health care and early childhood systems to promote developmental screening. Currently, Dr. Yockelson develops curriculum and teaches in the early childhood special education early childhood education, and special education programs at Brandman University. She also consults on the importance of all areas of early identification and referral into early intervention and early childhood special education systems. So we're very happy to have these three ASQ developers here with us today. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Jane, who's going to start off the presentation. Thank you, Amy, and welcome, everyone. We're all delighted to be here and hope that we can present some valuable um, information for you. We're very excited that the ASQ SE2 um, it will be coming out soon, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well as talking about um, using these two tools together. So the ASQ3 and the ASQ SE2 are both parent-completed developmental screening tools. So the, the purpose and the focus of them is to identify children who may have potential delays or disabilities um, to refer for further assessment. So they really um, divide children into two groups or three groups depending on how you look at it. But this child seems to be typical right now. Um, this one we may look at referral, just the, the middle group in the monitoring zone that we're not quite sure of. So that's the, the primary purpose. Today we're going to talk to you about kind of the enriching even using um, the ASQ and the ASQSE separately about together and how that really enhances what we can um, talk about with families in terms of child development as well as use the, the primary function of the ASQ and the ASQSE which is identifying children um, who should be referred for a developmental or social emotional evaluation. And finally using them together really gives a, a, a fuller picture of what we can tell families about um, and help them um, decide what to do about referral and follow-up based on questionnaire scores. Okay, next slide. So the ASQ3 um, is a developmental screening tool 
that looks at um, five domains of development, gross motor, fine motor, communication, problem solving, and personal social. There's six questions in each domain, 30 questions overall that are really kind of key to the to develop age of the child. And there's 21 intervals that cover the um, basically the birth to six um, age range. Okay, next. So the ASQSE2 is our second edition um, of the ASQSE that we'll be publishing in September of this year. Um, we will talk to you next about some of the, the changes in it, but it, you know, it remains the same in that it would, um, identifies children who are at risk for social and emotional difficulties, and it looks at seven key behavioral areas, self-regulation, compliance, communication, adaptive functioning, autonomy, affect, and interaction with people. All right. Okay, this is Jantina. Uh, thank you, Jane. It was a pleasure to be involved in the research and development of the second edition of the ASQSE, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what's new in the ASQSE 2, but I would like to acknowledge the fact that um, Jane has addressed each of these topics in much more detail in a webinar called What's New for the ASQSE 2 that was recorded on March 30th with Diane Bricker. So if any of you want more information on this, um, I'd encourage you to access that webinar if you haven't yet. Um, and Jane, please feel free to chime in if you have any additional comments or information you'd like to add. So here's what's new. Um, starting with the two-month questionnaire, um, which was developed to screen infants as young as one month. So the window for the two-month questionnaire starts at one month and ends at three months, and there are 16 scored items on that questionnaire. This was added because uh, programs such as Early Head Start uh, wanted to start screening social emotional development earlier and um, and it's, it's our research on it has looked really good. There's also now an expanded age range so beginning with the two month questionnaire that as I mentioned starts at one month. Um, the ASQSE now goes up to 72 months or six years of age so we didn't create another interval but expanded the window for the 60 month ASQSE to go up to 72 months, and the data looked good on that as well. Um, we have brand new data and cutoffs based on our new data, and um, our updated research was done on more than 14,000 children across the United States, so we have a nice representative population for the U.S. Uh, there is also now the addition of a monitoring zone, so very similar to uh, the ASQ3, for those of you that are familiar with that tool. And this monitoring zone um, helps users to clearly identify children who are close to the cutoff. And that can help with interpretation. Um, children with scores in the monitoring zone should be considered for follow-up activities. Um, there are likely to be some behaviors of concern. These should be addressed, and then the child should be monitored or, or followed closely to see, um, see how their progress is going. We also added some new items addressing behavior and communication, and these items were created specifically to elicit parent concerns that may point to autism or early communication issues. And then also, the questionnaire design was updated, so it is much more similar to the ASQ3 design now, um, more in line with ASQ3. So that um, was a nice thing, so the tools look like they, they belong together. Um, and then item and response refinements. We worked at making many of the items clearer, so we did some minor revisions to just um, uh, refine the clarity of items. And for some items, we would also add examples to make sure that they were um, clearer to parents. And then another change that we made was to change one of the response options um, from most of the time on the original ASQSE um, to often or always to better align with the, the items on the ASQSE. And then uh, we worked on the Span Spanish translation. So the Spanish translation has been revised. It was reviewed by a panel of Spanish-speaking experts in the early childhood and communication fields, so that was a nice change as well. And we also added a quick start guide, very similar to the ASQ3 quick start guide, and that's there to help users implement 
the ASQSE2 accurately and effectively, and so that people can keep basic information regarding both administration and scoring close at hand, in case they don't have time to dip into the user's guide. Um, and then finally, we are also in the process um, of having, or the authors are in the process of developing the learning activities book, and that's going to be very similar to the learning activities book that was created for the ASQ3 called Ages and Stages Learning Activities, and that's a really nice companion piece um, that provides targeted activities to parents and caregivers um, to help them support their child's social-emotional development. Next slide. Okay, um, so now we're going to address how the ASQ and ASQSD are different, um, why there are two different tools, and why and how to use these tools together. So like it says on the slide and like Jane's already addressed, the ASQ3 was designed to screen general development. So it's listening at communication, gross motor, fine motor problem solving, and personal social. And while the personal social domain includes some items that are related to social development, items in the personal social domain focus mostly on adaptive skills and address questions that are related to self-help activities. So the few items in the personal social domain that do address social and emotional content are not really sufficient to identify risk for social and emotional delay. These items overlap with adaptive skills in that they often are there because they help a child to get their needs met. So an example of this type of item would be, um, does your child get your attention or try to show you something by pulling on your hand or clothes? So that's a social skill, but it's used to um, meet an adaptive or self-help need. So um, Sue Yockelson is going to speak with you next. She was directly involved in the development of the original ASQSE and will address issues that were taken into consideration during that initial development and creation of this tool. And for more information on this, I would also encourage you to access the webinar, What's New in ASQSE 2. So, Sue? Yep, and Jantina, that was a perfect example to highlight how that social skill really does blend into adaptive. So, um, great example. So, in, <laughs> in and around the mid-1990s, the research in the field on social emotional development really highlighted what those of us in the field already knew, which was the importance of social and emotional development in the way a child functions within their environment. Also, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, IDEA reauthorization, added social and emotional development as an area for identification and intervention. In response to that, Programs and practitioners were calling for valid tools to assist in the identification for risk in this area. We were using the ASQ in the field at that time, and there were also other screening tools that were out and available, but because of the muddy nature of social and emotional development and our lack of understanding earlier, there really were no screening tools to address that area. Um, so we sat down as a group at the table and quickly realized that because of the breadth and the complexity of social and emotional behaviors, adding an additional six item domain to the ASQ itself would not fully capture the information needed and that the ASQ SE should be a separate companion screening tool to be used in conjunction with the developmental areas already on the ASQ. We had thought about adding it as a sixth domain because the ASQ SE really is that sixth domain, but it was too important, too large of an area to do it within the context of the existing ASQ. Additionally, because of the nature of social emotional development, the tools are built considerably differently from each other. The ASQ SE also captures concerns related to parent-child transactions, and that's something that we want to look for when we're talking about social and emotional development. So the next slide talks about why using the ASQ3 and the ASQSE2 together. 
um, it really presents a whole picture. Jantina shares a story. So I'm sharing a story that Jantina shares about Liz, who is another one of um, our, our training, in our training cadre, about being having the whole piece of the pie. And you really need all of the pieces of the pie to really understand. So thanks for reminding me of that story, Jantina. Um, because the ASQSC is an additional domain of development, using both tools together presents a whole picture of the child. Additionally, behavior and development are so closely related that without information from both, inaccurate interpretations may occur. So think, for example, of a child who's hitting and grabbing items from others, either in a home environment or at a center-based environment. At first glance, that child might be labeled as having the same, um, behavior disorders. However, if an ASQ developmental indicates a score in the referral zone for communication, a professional may change their opinion as the acting out behavior might function for the child as a way to get their needs met in the absence of the communication skills. Conversely, if the ASQ is administered, one may miss the tremendous impact on social and emotional development stemming from those communication concerns. So on the actual tools itself, there's a reminder that you need to gather more information. One of the referral considerations listed on the ASQ SE2 summary sheet is developmental factors. Have you considered development in the interpretation of the result of the ASQ SE? One of the overall concerns on the ASQ3 is, do you have concerns about your baby's behavior? Is this concern or issue that you're seeing reflected on the ASQ3 linked in any way to the child's behavior and or social emotional development. There's just such a strong interrelationship between behavior and development that we need to look at the whole picture. Additionally, I already spoke about IDA, but Head Start calls for all six areas to be considered. Um, so when we look at the ASQSC, it is that sixth domain. Um, so many people then, when we look at the information and the questions that you sent in advance, sent questions about, well, how do we do this? And, and we'll talk in a minute about the how, but really the most important aspect of that question isn't about the how and the when should we administer what tool, but rather it's that when the results are shared and the recommendations are made and the conversations happen with the families, that the results are from both questionnaires are taken into consideration. Um, these tools can be completed independently and or facilitated by a professional. They're valid either way. And so um, before we get into that, I do want to share a case study. This is a case study that highlights the importance of using both tools to glean information. Um, and when we talk about this case, I want you to think about how might you interpret each tool in the absence of the other. We'll talk more about this. So in summary, this is a case study on a little girl, 12 months, named Andrea. On the ASQ3, she's below the cutoff in gross motor. She's above the cutoff in all other areas. So that's something you want to keep in mind, and we'll be looking at these tools as well. There are overall concerns about her size and about crying. The ASQSE2 score is significantly above the cutoff, and we'll look to see what that looks like on the actual summary sheet. That many parent concerns are, through, are listed and discussed throughout the questionnaire. So when you look at the ASQSE, 55 points are based upon parent concern. 11 items are indicated as I have a concern. And again, there's concern about eating, fussing, crying, and sleeping. So if you look at the ASQ summary sheet, you can see that the child's above areas all the way, except you can score in the um, referral zone for gross motor. Follow-up would indicate a referral to a pediatrician with specific concerns about motor development and a referral to early intervention for gross motor, looking at gross motor. And when you look at the parent concerns, they also relate very strongly to the gross motor. Is it putting weight on feet? Um, mostly uses the right side. 
there are some additional concerns that had been added, and one concern that was added after discussion with the parent about vision. Um, most people would make those referrals. Depending upon your program resources, you might say, well, let's do a little bit of monitoring prior to referral, and then make a referral for motor. So now let's take a look at the ASQSE. And here you have the cover sheet. We have this included so that you can see what it looks like. It looks more like the ASQ that you're familiar with. There are information on the um, ASQS. No, you can go on this, okay, me. Um, on remembering to, um, you know, call to ask questions, gives follow-up instructions for the parent. So here we have a summer a score sheet again that looks very similar or a questionnaire to the ASQ where there's a place at the far right for you to total up your scores and a place at the bottom for you to add your score. The circle on the far right, that circle column is the concern. So you can see that on that page there's two concerns from parents. Even though one of the items is a is marked as sometimes the parents still had a concern. And as we move through the questionnaire, you can see that there are numerous concerns. And there was a concern about eating, and the mom filled out the information there. And as we move forward, you can see that there continue to be some concerns. And here we have some interesting information. The mom says, my mother says she's spoiled. My doctor says she isn't gaining weight like she should. So we're starting to get indication that there's pressure on this mom. And again, as we move through, um, a lot of those items that we see in the overall have to do with fussiness, crying, not being able to calm down, and that conflicting pressure from grandma and the pediatrician. Now this child, as an aside, what we find out afterwards, has been diagnosed with failure to thrive. Um, we also have that same question at the end about her being really smart. She flirts with everyone. Everyone loves her. What do you enjoy most about your baby? So now turning your attention to the ASQSE summary sheet, you can see that it also resembles the ASQ that you know, you're know you already familiar with. There's a place for you to transfer the scores and then add the total. The cutoff is the same as on the um, original ASQSE where you have a cutoff score and then a place for you to put that score. Now if you'll notice, the cutoff is 50. Her score is 140 which is considerably high. And remember, 55 of those points were because of parent concern. What you'll notice is there is an equivalent to the grid on the ASQ where you have an unshaded area. That means that the child's well within typically developing a shaded area. That means monitoring in a dark shaded area. That means referral. Now, because of the difference in the way the ASQ and the ASQSE are built, this is done based upon um, interquartile percent and percent to percentile rather than standard deviation the way the ASQ. You would mark on that chart where the child fell. So, for example, if the child fell within the monitoring zone, you might put a big X or a line to indicate that the child's within that zone. In this case, you can see that there's an X way to the right of the dark shaded because she, there are um, tremendous concerns. When you look at the comments, you can see that there are multiple concerns about calming, sleeping, eating, and a few about um, the way she responds. Lots of parent concerns. There's the follow-up referral consideration, which was completed only after considering all information from the ASQ and the ASQSC. So the transaction between the parent and child here might be a concern because of the number of concerns that the mom marked. If one only looked at the ASQSC, it would be possible to draw the erroneous conclusion that this is just an overly anxious mom who doesn't need, who really just needs parent education. And you know, I could see somebody looking at that without knowing that there were those motor concerns, just saying, you know, she's really anxious, she's getting pressure from her mom, she needs parent education. Let's just give her parent education and see how that resolves. Um, but, you know, if we did that, we would miss that gross motor referral, which was really critical for this child. And if, again, only the ASQ were looked at, the impact of that parent-child relationship and potential medical concerns would be missed. 
Um, so kind of summarizing, when this whole case was said and done, there were significant medical issues going on that might have been missed. It impacted her development. It also impacted the parent-child relationship and the way the mother was interacting with the child. The child did end up being diagnosed later with a degenerative disorder. So the mom knew there was something going on. And it was more than what motor would indicate, and it was more than what just an over-anxious parent would indicate. So we needed the entirety of the information to get a really good understanding on that. Um, let's see. So now what we're going to do is get to some of your questions. I'm going to let Gentina take over and talk about um, some of the implementation questions that you have. Thank you, Sue. That was really helpful in thinking about how to use both tools together. And so now we're going to talk about uh, different strategies for using both tools together. And um, there are so many different ways to administer the ASQ and ASQSC. One of the strengths for the tools, I think, is the flexible administration methods. But this can also um, be challenging sometimes because people have to decide, OK, so how are we going to administer these tools? How are we going to use them in our programs? And, you know, um, the programs need to decide what works best for them, for their agency, as well as the families that they serve. So um, we're going to talk about four different kind of scenarios or ways to use the ASQ and ASQSE based on feedback that we've gotten from um, users in the field. So we're going to talk about how some examples for how both tools could be administered in a home visiting situation, center-based programs, and then Sue's going to talk about clinical settings and online administration. So I'll um, start by talking about some different scenarios and examples for how the tools could be used together and in a home visiting situation. So in this first example, um, home visitors can lead both questionnaires with parents one or two weeks prior to the scheduled screening visit. Um, the parents can then engage with their children and observe and or mark those items that they feel confident about. And then the home visitors can then assist the parents in looking for or discussing items that they might be unsure about. Um, so this is a really nice way for parents to, um, to have some time to look over the tools and to watch their children's behaviors and think about their children's um, development and behavior as well. The ASQ is, is more of an observational tool. Oh, I'm still on example one. The ASQ is more of an observational tool, and the instructions for the ASQ actually say that parents are encouraged to try each activity with their child before marking a response, and then they may need to try the activities more than one time. So by leaving the ASQ with the family ahead of time before the, the home visit, this allows the parent the chance to do that in a very naturalistic way. Um, the ASQSE is more focused on the parent's experience um, with their child's behavior. So instructions on the ASQSE say um, that parents need to answer based on what they know about their child's behavior. So it's more of a reflective tool. And leaving both tools with parents allow them that chance to observe and reflect on their child's behavior. OK, next example. So um, for the second example, um, this addresses the order of administration of the tools. So the ASQ and ASQSE do not have to be administered at the same time. One can be used before the other. And there is no rule as to which one must be used first. And this is a question we get a lot when we're doing trainings is, do I have to do the ASQ first? Well, the answer is no. It really depends on your program and the families you're working with and what makes the most sense for you. Um, so traditionally, programs have used the ASQ3 first as it covers the majority of the domains of general development. And this can be really helpful for programs to consider a child's general development because that's an important factor to consider when social emotional concerns are identified. So when there are social emotional concerns, we always want people to go back and think about the child's development. So if you start with the ASQ3, you are likely to have that information or have had conversations about the child's general development. 
Um, but there's also no general reason as to why a program can't use the ASQSE2 first. Um, there may be some programmatic reasons. For example, if a child's recently taken into custodial care, you may want to wait a while um, and give that child a chance to acclimate to that new environment. Um, but, you know, some programs may choose to use the ASQSE first. It's, it's a very conversational tool. And it can be a really good tool for helping the home visitor get to know the child and family. So there are um, advantages for each of the tools to be used um, before the other. It really um, just depends on the particular situation for the program and the families. Next slide, Amy. So now I'm going to address three different examples of ways that the ASQ and ASQSE can be used in a center-based program. So in the first example, parents can be asked to complete both tools at home independently and then return them to the teacher when they're complete. Uh, and actually both ASQ and ASQSE were designed to be tools that can be sent home and completed by parents or caregivers. Um, but programs can also invite parents to complete the tools in the program as well. Um, so in the second example, um, parents can complete the ASQ3 during a parent education night or a slow warm-up where a small group of parents might come together to learn about the program. They can be given the ASQSC to complete while the children are playing, or it can be sent home. So Many programs like to provide opportunities for the parents to look for skills and complete the ASQ, ASQ3 in their program. So for example, during parent education nights. And this provides a really nice opportunity for teachers to assist in the completion of the tools and also to celebrate with the parents the children's achievement as well as answer any questions um, or address any concerns that might come, out, come up about development. Um, like I said earlier, the ASQSE is more of a reflective tool, so um, it usually takes parents 10 to 15 minutes to complete it. They can do that at home before they come to school, or they could do it right there in the school setting as well as um, when the children are playing. Um, and then they can bring those completed questionnaires back to the teacher or give them to the teacher if they're doing it um, that night. Teachers can review both the tools then and should provide follow-up later on to ensure confidentiality. So they might be administered together in a more um, social environment with other parents. Um, discussion can happen around different developmental um, stages, questions, concerns, but then follow-up should happen um, individually with parents to protect confidentiality. Next slide. So. Um, for our third scenario, example number three, um, many center-based programs have also selected to include the ASQ and ASQSE as part of their parent conferences, and we hear about this um, scenario quite often. So um, in the third example, we've um, described a situation where teachers can facilitate the administration of the ASQ during a parent conference. They can ask parents to independent, independently complete the ASQSE um, and the ASQ either before or after the parent conference and then return it to them. So actually, let me correct myself, they complete the ASQ during the parent conference and then um, bring the completed ASQ with them. So what's nice about this administration method is that it allows the teachers to provide the materials and assist parents in completing the items that they might be unsure about. So. Um, doing it with them can be really helpful and also can help reinforce the, the relationship between the parent and the, the child and the teacher. Um, this administration method also provides an opportunity for teachers and parents to discuss the similarities and differences in the skills and behaviors that children display at school and at home, and that can be a really inter interesting conversation to have between um, parents and providers. So Sue's now going to discuss how the ASQ and ASQSE can be used in a clinical setting as well as online administration methods using the ASQ Family Access. Thanks, and I think I'm unmuted, which is a good thing. Um, so screenings have been conducted across settings and across disciplines and programs. One of the more recent phenomena we've seen related to developmental screening um, 
and when I say recent, I'm referring to within the last 10 years, has been an increase of developmental screening being conducted in clinical settings and in healthcare settings. Primarily, this is because of the policy on early identification and referral through the American Academy of Pediatrics, which says that children should be screened three times before their birth, first birthday, a uh, third birthday, I'm sorry, primarily at nine months between 24 or um, 18 and, and then 24 to 30 months. So um, we're, we're seeing children receiving screenings in medical offices, and I did spend a number of years working with pediatricians and family practitioners on using the questionnaire within their practices. The most common way that the offices choose to do their developmental screening is to provide a questionnaire and a little kit with some materials when the patient checks in. So they check in and the receptionist at the front desk will actually have a script, read it to the parent saying that this is um, a questionnaire that is used with all children, or two questionnaires, the ASQ and the ASQSC, with all children to um, look at their skills and behaviors and to remind them that the pediatrician will be reviewing, or the healthcare provider will be reviewing the questionnaire with the family um, after it's completed. The parent then goes in, completes the tools, and then when they are brought back to the room, the medical assistant or nurse will score the questionnaire and then leave it for the healthcare provider to review prior to going into the visit. So um, that is the most frequent way that I've seen physicians' offices or healthcare clinics use the tool. Now, there can be variations on that. For example, there are some that will have volunteers that will come in and actually facilitate with the parent. There are some offices that have areas set up with materials and supplies so the parents can actually go and play with their children, and some will give them materials and supplies to use. Um, not that many are, are needed. This mostly are things that parents know about their children, but there might be some things such as crayons or child-proof scissors or blocks and beads. So that's pretty much um, what they'll use and the important thing there is that you really want to schedule the parent to come in prior to the time of the visit so that they do have that time to complete it. Um, some offices will send the questionnaires home to parents prior to the visit. It can be sent home two weeks early. That way the parent has an opportunity to look at the information, um, complete it with their child, and then bring it with them to the visit already completed. Um, that's an option. There's some risk that the parents will forget to bring it, in which case you can have extra copies there for them to fill out in the waiting room, but by then they've already done those items. Some offices will actually give the questionnaire at the prior well-child visit. So at the, you know, when they come in at nine months, they might leave a 12-month questionnaire, give the 12-month questionnaire, do these with your child, um, this, these are items that they will begin doing, um, let's see how you're um, assessing and evaluating your child's behavior, and when you come in at 12 months, bring these forms. So the same thing does apply. Um, one of the ways in which clinical settings are using the ASQ now is electronically. And they can use it electronically a couple of ways. Some of the offices will actually have tablets that the parents will complete online in the office. Other officers, there's one office, for example, I worked with, where they had one of the medical assistants assigned to this, and they would actually sit at a computer and use the computer ASQ online to help the parent complete the questionnaire. One of the more interesting ways in which offices can use this, and this also has been used by center-based programs as well, is to use the family access. Family access is a way for parents to complete the ASQ online from their own home, their own personal computer. The program that has the ASQ online access can get what's called a, a family access link that they will send to the family. 
and the families will get an email saying, please click here to access your next ages and stages um, and ages and stages social emotional questionnaire. The program will prompt parents to download it so that they have time to play, engage with their child, to consider the items that are on the questionnaire. They will then go back to the computer, go back into the link, and fill out the responses. Once they've, they've filled out the responses, they submit it, and the data, the information goes back to whichever administrating program it is, whether it be an early childhood, family, child care, um, whoever the lead administrator is for that, or a um, medical practice. And whoever that administrator is then, when they log on to their computer next, their computer will send them a, an alert saying that they have five completed ASQs to download. When they download the ASQ, they get all of the information that the family provided, plus they get a um, possible interpretation, like based upon these scores, this is what you may want to consider. The online ASQ also has follow-up letters that can be completed and modified and sent back to inform families of the results. So that's another option for people to think about in terms of um, using the ASQ and the ASQSE. So to tie it all together, thank you. <laughs> um, unless screening is conducted across all developmental areas, important information may be missed, leading to erroneous referral decisions that undermine our attempts at early identification and referral. And by not um, having all the information, we're at risk of, um, oh, whoops, back, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, by not having all the information needed to make the decisions, we're missing out on an opportunity to best support our families to our greatest ability. What we really want is as much information as possible to get a big picture of the child's skills and behaviors across areas. By using the ASQ and the ASQSC together, we get that big picture to help our, inform our work with families. So now you can advance. <laughs> Sorry, I, Sue, was, I think my, my <laughs> finger just dropped too early. <laughs> That's fine. I don't know if it was a hint or not. No, no, it's not. So thank you, Sue and Jantina and Jane, for um, presenting the webinar. I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about the ASQ Training and Trainers Institute because both Sue and Jantina um, along with Elizabeth Twombly, are trainers at the NEXT Institute. Um, this is user's first chance to be trained on the second edition of ASQ SE. It's being held in Philadelphia in August this year. And so if you're interested, um, you can visit the ASQ website or the Brooks Publishing website. There's a link on your screen, and you can find out lots more information. Um, and then before we head to our Q&A portion, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. And as a thank you, we're giving um, a 20% discount code that you can use to pre-order the second edition of ASQSE. Or you can use it for SEAM or any of the other ASQ products or any Brooks products. So this code that's up on your screen in, in orange is good through the end of June. So you can just order on our website or send in a fax or PO um, using that code. So now we're excited to um, take questions. So I'm going to open my question box here, and I'm sure we have lots of questions here about the presentation. Once I scroll through all the questions that say people can't see the slides from the beginning, <laughs> they can probably delete all of those. Um, OK. So a lot of these were covered later on in the presentation um, as I'm reading through them. So someone has asked, um, what, if, what if the questionnaires are completed solely by professionals? Is that reliable? So I don't know if, I think you, all three of you can probably just take turns answering if you want. <laughs> we'll all say the same thing. <laughs> Tina, do you want to take that, or Jane? OK, so this is Jane. I'll start. And, um, you know, the preference that I think we would all say is that parents, um, these are parent-completed questionnaires, and they were um, developed to be completed by parents. That said, um, that, that sometimes is not possible. And, um, you know, we give kind of a rough estimate of caregivers, primary caregivers, um, 
for a child that see a child between 15 and 20 hours a week that have contact and will really know them um, can complete the, the, the questionnaires. There are also going to be different samples of behavior that parents and professionals see. Um, and certainly during a brief office visit, the sample behavior that you see in a child is going to be very different from what you see from that child at home. So the, the um, results might not always be the same, but we would encourage parents to be involved. It's sometimes uh, we want a professional's um, input and want to see how a, a child is acting um, at school in another environment, and in those cases we would encourage caregivers or, or other um, professionals to complete them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Jane. Um, we had a comment from um, one of our listeners who um, said during previous, some of her previous training, she was told to first do the ASQ3, and if a child scores low in the social-emotional domain, to then continue with the ASQSE. So I know you presented a very good case for using both tools, but I don't know if you'd like to elaborate maybe a little bit more about programs that um, maybe are unsure or um, I guess we're having, or right now we're just doing one and what they should do. Yeah, um, this is Jantina. Um, as I said earlier, the, the personal social domain really is not getting at social emotional development and there's so many more items in the ASQSE that, that are really give you a much more in-depth understanding about social emotional development. Um, so in answer to that question, there's there's also now an, an item in the overall section on the ASQ and that asks, do you have concerns about your child's behavior? Um, that's probably a better predictor about whether or not to use the ASQSE as a follow-up tool, but we always like to caution um, people who are using both tools that um, it's really nice when you're using the ASQSE with all families. Um, families could become defensive if you are just giving it with to certain families when there are concerns. Um, that's one thing to take into consideration. But it's also it's, it's a nice option to have. So rather than looking at scores in the personal social domain, I would look more at that overall item about do you have concerns about your child's behavior and then invite the parent to complete the ASQSC if that was something they wanted more information about. And I'm going to open that up to the other um, Jane and Sue for so, that one too. I just had a brief comment, this is Jane, and, and that programs don't have enough resources often to do both questionnaires. And I think when we're getting the question, well, what, what should I use, what should I do, then we'll say, you know, do the ASQ first because you're going to get a general developmental look. And then in those cases where it's needed follow-up. But I think it's, that's more a resource question, that if you have enough resources, um, you know, I think it's great to do both. But that's not always the case. Sure. Thanks, Jane and Dantina. Um, we have a couple questions about what to do and how to approach caregivers when the feedback they give on ASQ questionnaires are different, drastically different than what's observed um, in a child care setting or preschool. How, how would, should we, should users handle that situation like that? Sue, that's a great one for you. Can I jump in? <laughs> You've got some good stories. Yeah. Well, yeah, we deal with this all the time. Um, and you know, there are lots of stories, personal stories I can tell about the fact that children do show different skills in different settings. And I've been, as both a parent and as a teacher, I've had children do things in one setting and not in another. And my own daughters, who are twins, were not speaking at school because they were very slow, very slow to warm up. And I can only imagine how outraged I'd be if my daughter's teacher suggested that maybe I was not giving her accurate information about the fact that they spoke at home. And, I, and I've had kids in my program where the parents said they did something at home they didn't do in school, and vice versa, that they did things in school that they didn't do at home. And so there's one consideration, which is the fact that children do show different skills across settings, and that's something that Jane mentioned earlier. But there's also the possibility that, um, you know, there's 
emerging skills and interpretation of skills. But in the case where a teacher and a parent are seeing completely different things, it boils down to two things. One is the relationship with the parent, and the other is your interpersonal communication skills. And what I would recommend is when you have that meeting with the parent, saying to the parent, gee, you know, it, I'm so happy to hear that, and, and often we see this with communication, that, you know, Carlos is using words at home. Can you please share with me the words that he's using and give me suggestions on how I can elicit that behavior at school because I'm not seeing that. And if you have something that's working, I'd really like to try it here as well. Um, if a teacher, you know, we, we say that we are family-centered, but then if we act in a way that doesn't truly value the experience and the knowledge and the understanding of the parent, we're undermining that relationship. And so if a parent has information, we can use it. At that point, a parent in that meeting might very well say, oh, no, I didn't understand the question. He's really not using words. He's pointing and then you can clarify. But it's perfectly acceptable when you sit down and have a meeting to go over the results of the questionnaire to change the responses. So let's say the parent comes in, you have that conversation, it turns out a child isn't doing something or they are, you can actually erase and change as long as you're within the window still for that age, you can modify the questionnaire as a result of the conversation. As Jantina and you know, mentioned earlier, the questionnaire is a conversation starter. And you can reach a common understanding. And if a parent insists that a child's doing something that a teacher's not seeing, then the child the parent's doing then the child's doing that and that should be the score on record. Does that great. Jane Jen? <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks, Sue. Um all right, we have a question about a specific um, question on the 30-month ASQ. Um, this user has a parent who is upset with the question um, that asked about gender. The question, I think, asked, are you a boy or a girl? Um, and the parent was concerned because they, they know fam um, family members or friends who are transgender. And this user is wondering if you'd encountered similar feedback um, and kind of how to handle that. And um, is there a plan to change the question? Um, for future editions? I'm assuming this is, I think this is on the ASQ3. Yes, this is Jane. Um, we actually have given some thought to that and I think on, um, have decided for when we're asking gender questions to put some qualifiers on that because I, we are more open I think now about transgender issues and even young children who may feel that. Um, you know, I, I think we changed the wording um, for, for in one instance on the ASQSC is, does your child think that he is a boy or a girl or something? So it's not, does he know or what does what does she think? Um, but, you know, I think that's a really good example of a question that you should just give if you think it's going to offend people or um, it, it kind of is uncomfortable for you to ask. Um, I think it was something that we commonly ask and it's been used on kind of intelligence tests and adaptive tests for years and years and years, but our our society changes, and I think that's one really good example of, of changing mores and uh, of feeling comfortable as an administrator that that's, you, know, you don't have to ask that question. And this is Sue, and in one of the pilots, I've spent a lot of time looking at completed questionnaires, and I've had a number of parents write in the overall concerns, um, do you have any other concerns about your child? that the child does have gender confusion issues or the parent says, you know, my, my you know, three-year-old wants to, son wants to only wear girls' clothes and vice versa. And so it could be a good opportunity, um, a related question with, that might stimulate the parent to ask a question that they wouldn't normally think of. Thanks, Sue and Jane. Um, we have a question from a user um, asking if there's a refresher for how to calculate um, the age when a child is a premature child. So I just wanted to point out that there is on the ASQ website, there is now an age calculator that you type in the child's age and your administration date and how many weeks premature, and then it adjusts 
the child's age so you can choose the correct questionnaire. When, um, so what you do is you sometimes use it, a questionnaire that's younger than the child's age if their adjusted age is younger than their chronological age. And you only do that up to two years of age. Um, and oh, go on. I was going to say this ties into another question. Someone else asked whether or not the ASQSE2 would have adjusted age for premature children. And I can say that, yes, um, the first edition you did not have to adjust age for. But for the second edition, um, we are recommending that um, you do adjust the child's age for both ASQ3 and ASQSE2. So, Jane, I don't know if that was what you were going to say. Um, well, I was also going to say that we hope to have an app soon. Yes. We do hope to have an app very soon. Um, so keep an eye on your ASQ newsletter. We have it final. We're just going through the process of getting it um, released through iTunes and then through, um, I forget what the Android store is called because <laughs> I have an iPhone. <laughs> um, so one of the questions was from um, a user about the first edition of ASQSC and said that it was used mainly to encourage referrals to mental health. Um, is this still true, or is now ASQSC to, I guess, have a broader goal? I would say for the, even the first one, it's to identify social-emotional delays. And, and where you refer depends on where you are, what the resources are, what the family wants that a referral to early intervention or early childhood special education based on ASQSE results is, um, is a good way to go. Um, and also mental health. I think there's some instances where children might have an, a high ASQSE score and not qualify for um, Part C or 619 services. But certainly I would consider that in the realm of referrals um, for children who have high um, ASQSC scores on, on both editions. Thanks, Jane. Um, we have a user who's um, she's said she was trained about five years ago, um, and that her tra the tr when she was first trained, it was emphasized the need to do the ASQ questionnaires collaboratively with collaboratively with parents rather than just giving it to them, unless you really didn't have another option, and her agency follows that practice. Um, and she's wondering if that recommendation has changed um, or if we should still kind of try to do it collaboratively. That's, uh, this is Jantina. Um, well, both the ASQ and ASQSE were designed to be done mail out, um, but I think the conversations that happen when the tools are done um, collaborative, collaboratively add another dimension of richness. Um, so I don't think we have an official recommendation saying that they should be done collaboratively, but I think that it's, um, it's, it's a good thing to do, and we, we just recommend, we, we say that um, it's, it's a helpful way to do it. Um, but it's not, I, I wouldn't say that it's an official rule, would you, Jane? Right. No. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm going to jump in for a minute because a lot of it, I think, term is based upon the goals of the agency. So yeah. the goals and the resources. So if it's an agency that says that building parent relationship and parent education and empowerment is one of their main goals, then doing the ASQ and the ASQSE together with families does just that. It builds relationship with family. It educates family on development. It um, the interventionist can possibly model behaviors or ways to interact with the child. Um, and then learning about the tool itself can be empowering to parents because then they could go on to advocate for their children if necessary. And to piggyback on that, Sue, one, one, um, there are some situations where we say that it shouldn't be just sent home and it should be done collaboratively. And that's when there are programs that are serving families with risk factors. So, you know, if it's a, a program that's working with um, families that are um, involved in child welfare or teen parents or may have some mental health issues or literacy issues, Addiction um, issues. then you would also want to um, do that collaboratively and not send it home. As well as language issues. Yeah, There's language too. Yeah. yeah. Great, thanks all. Um, we have a question from a home visitor who 
um, sees, does monthly home visits, and she's asking whether um, all that was presented today is feasible for a program that sees babies on a once-a-month basis to conduct both the ASQ3 and the ASQSE2 at the same monthly home visit. I'll go ahead and take that one since I talked about home visiting. This is Jantina. Um, I think it is feasible to do it. I think um, what I've heard from users in the field is that you know each tool can take around 45 minutes when you're doing it one-on-one -on -one with a family because of the discussions that come up. Um, I think, once again, I'm going to go back to our example. It's really helpful to leave the questionnaires with the family before you visit. That gives parents a chance to read the items, become familiar with them, um, and, and have a chance to look for skills and think about behaviors. It may also be helpful for the home visitor to go over briefly the questionnaires with the family before leaving them with them to kind of uh, teach them about what them and, and how to answer them and what types of development they're looking at. So um, that would be my answer to that one. Sue, you want to chime in? Sorry, I was Sue. muted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm here. I was muted, and um, I just drew a blank. So, <laughs> you have one sentence summary here. <laughs> and they just had to duck out. She's got another appointment to go to. So just to let you know, she's she sends her. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, we are coming up on our time. Um, so I'm just going to ask. Oh, uh, we were talking about wait, ASQ and ASQSE, right? Whether you could use. Um, it, it's something where the ASQSE can be sent out early to be completed. And then the, AS, the ASQSE, because that's really more of a reflective process, and they could do the ASQ3 together and then go over both results at the home visit. Sorry, that's where you were. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over just a couple more of the questions um, before we sign off, because we are running sh um, close to the end of our time. We're a little over, actually. Um, there were several questions about the ASQ Online system that Sue talked about. So this is a subscription service. Um, so you can subscribe to online management, and then the family access, the ability to let parents complete the questionnaires is an add-on module that you can get. Um, there is not an app to access the questionnaire, but we are um, right now working on making the web, the ASQ Online website and the family access pages all um, uh, mobile accessible. So it will automatically size, the, the website will automatically size down to the size of your phone or the size of your, um, your tablet. So, um, but you do, you will still need access um, to either 3G, 4G, or um, Wi-Fi to do that once. And that should be available um, in the next several months. Um, it'll release a mobile optimized version. Um, let's see. Oh, someone asked about the seven key behavioral areas for ASQSE. So I'm going to go back to that slide that shows. Um, so put that up on the screen so that listener can see the seven behavioral areas that ASQSE screens. Um, and then I, one last question we'll take, and if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, there were some specific questions about training and ordering questions about the second edition, so we'll follow up with those over email afterwards. So our last question um, I think is an interesting one. It's a program that is offering um, ASQ3 via their online portal for parents to um, allow parents to complete it, and right now they only offer ASQSE as a supplement when the parent indicates behavior concerns, and they're considering offering both tools publicly, and they wanted to hear your thoughts and if you recommend offering both of those. Sue, do you want to take that one, or? Okay, can you re-ask the question? So um, the program offers ASQ3 publicly right now through their online portal, and they're considering, and they don't offer ASQSE to everyone right now. Only when a parent who fills out the ASQ3, if they indicate their behavior concerns, then they must follow up. Um, and so they're wondering whether they want, they're thinking about offering both tools publicly, so a parent mm -hmm. could fill out both tools and whether you would recommend doing that. Okay. I, I would, absolutely, because that then a lot, gives a much bigger picture so that you could capture information. As, as um, Liz Gentina said that Liz said, there you go, um, it's another piece of the pie, and, and you want as many pieces of the pie as possible. Um, and if they're doing it at home in research, 
it takes, most parents say that it takes around, you know, 10 minutes to complete the questionnaire, 10 to 20 minutes. So adding the ASQSE, um, because it does not involve actually doing things with your child, is a pretty quick um, questionnaire to complete online. Great. Thanks. Um, okay, so thank you so much for your time. And again, we'll follow up for all of these um, specific ordering or training questions or any questions that we didn't get a chance chance to. But thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, um, Jantina and Sue, and please pass along our thanks to Jane for presenting. Um, my pleasure. Yep, and it was really great to have all of you join us today, and hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you all. You too. <laughs> thank you, Amy. Bye-bye. To all the listeners out there. Yeah.